Hi at the Joint Learning Initiative on Faith and Local Communities. Um, we welcome you all today. Um, nice to see some um, familiar faces and some new faces um, uh, joining. We will be hearing today from Professor Cecilia Lynch, um, who is Professor of Political Science at the University of California, Irvine, and um, presenting on her new book, Wrestling with God, Ethical Precarity in Christianity and International Relations. We're going to hear from um, Professor Lynch for about 25 minutes um, to present the new book. Um, and then we will hear a response or a dialogue between um, Professor Alistair Ager and Professor Lynch. Alistair Ager is Director of the Institute of Global Health and Development at Queen Margaret University, Edinburgh. Um, uh, so we're very excited about the presentations today. Um, I actually have a slide that I haven't put up yet, which is the book cover, um, and I will do that quickly um, while we're listening to the beginning um, of the presentation. Um, um, but for now, for the time being, I'm very happy to hand over to you, uh, Professor Lynch, to hear your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, for some of you, it's early in the morning, and for others, it might be late in the afternoon. Um, but I do want to thank the Joint Learning Initiative. It's an initiative that I learned of some time ago um, in Geneva, and I uh, really um, appreciate the opportunity to present here. I want to thank Olivia Wilkinson and also Rima El uh for organizing this, and Alistair Ager, um, whom I've known for, for some time, and I was able to uh, comment on a, on a um, talk he gave at Fullerton. Uh, in Southern California some years ago. So it's really nice to um, have him with all of his expertise be able to comment on this. This discussion series is a wonderful initiative and I hope to become a regular participant. Um, there's one more person I'd like to thank and that's Martin French, um, the author, uh, the artist, I'm sorry, whose work is reproduced on the book's cover. Um, it's not often that um, I find something that I really like uh, for a book cover and um, in this case, the artist was quite gracious and agreed and apparently is even reading the book. So that's <laughs> that I'm, I'm very, very grateful for. So the book engages <clears throat> with the connection between religion and humanitarianism, um, especially chapter six, but it really looks behind in, and in a sense questions things that animate how we look at and analyze religion in international politics in general, and also how and why, um, in my view, hang on here, uh, neither religion in the form of Christianity nor secularism in its modern incarnations have ever been able to get it right in terms of how we act vis-a-vis -vis others, um, others who are not like us and, um, I'm interested in how this perpetuates violence of different kinds, material violence, which is often uh, horrendous, and also epistemic violence against cultures, systems of thought, cosmologies, other religions. Um, and so along with this story, which I try to trace uh, for, with Christianity and secularism from the early modern period to the present, there are a few subplots. Uh, one has to do with the idea that uh, religious ethics and violence vary in different historical periods, who the other is is different, um, how Christianity is practiced, the ethics of how otherness or what academics call alterity and violence are legitimized or challenged varies over time and place. And there's still there's a painful repetition of ethical issues over time and problems over time. And some things recur in new guises. And um, I would argue that humanitarianism is one of these. Another is attempts by both Christian and secular um, authorities, we might say, um, to suppress or eradicate traditional or indigenous religion. But these uh, religious practices, indigenous practices, indigenous commitments recur throughout many of the chapters, especially chapter three, um, five and six. So I think it's important. Uh, another thing I argue is that there's a symbiosis and yet a difference or suspension, uh, which I try to affect of the terms Christianity and secularisms. 
Both are important and powerful traditions in international politics with intermingling and often coalescing ethics. And so for those who are um, faith-based humanitarians, very often the problem is the secular bias of humanitarianism, which I do acknowledge, but a lot of academics come from a point that, Christi that secularisms are really an outgrowth of modern Christianity uh, from the 17th century to the present, which if you want, we can get into. So in my mind, um, the liminal spaces are important. Um, I'm drawn to the tensions and the ethical struggles. And so this is the genesis of the term in the subtitle, ethical precarity. It seems to me that any of our ethical struggles results in commitments and actions that we need to recognize are ethically precarious. They're constantly in need of examination, reflection, and probably revision. Um, in other words, um, it's a state of constant angst, <laughs> which is where the term wrestling comes from. And I guess that's the state that I tend to occupy. Um, so I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the book's architecture that is the progression of chapters. And I'm gonna focus mostly on then building up to chapter six, which is the chapter on humanitarianism. And then I wanna conclude with a few reflections on um, what's happening now in terms of COVID-19 and movements um, against um, anti-Black racism, especially in this country, but also worldwide and in much of the global South. <clears throat> so in the first chapter, um, I lay out debates that the book de deals with, um, but including the problem uh, for different periods, for Christians in different periods of identifying and achieving what we might call the common good. And it's interesting to me that this notion of the common good is used a lot both in uh, religious parlance, um, especially Christian, but not limited to Christian, um, but also in uh, notions of the, the proper democratic forms. What is the, pro what is the common good uh, was a term that was used a lot in, um, by the founding fathers, for example, in the US. So this problem of identifying and achieving it results in ethical precarity in the attempts to do so. And it very often results in violence and paternalism. Uh, sometimes both, sometimes one or the other, and that's what I call painfully repetitious. Um, and then in the next chapter, I lay out my approach to analyzing religion and world politics, which has been a long time in coming. I call it neo-Weberian after Max Weber um, for several reasons. Max Weber contextualized religious ethics in the midst of broader social, economic, and political processes to see how they evolve with circumstance, which was the uh, basis for his famous um, thesis on um, Protestantism and capitalism, for example, and how they went together. Um, but I focus more on ethical struggles over defining the common good and how to enact it. So that's why I call it the neo part, because I argue that Weber in the end doesn't really talk about ethical struggles. It's a little mechanistic, his, his views. So these struggles produce tensions that we all have to interpret in our own circumstances. We're not all theologians. So I call this process of interpretation popular casuistry. I'm not gonna go into that here, but if anybody's interested, we could talk later. Um, and then I go into several chapters of um, actual more empirical discussions of how these struggles and tensions have operated, um, focusing on selected people and movements in different periods. And I kind of characterize these different periods. So chapter three is about the early modern period. And I talk about uh, folks like Bartolome de las Casas, who is often considered a founder of human rights and defended the, the Indians, the Amerindians against some of the powers that be, Spain um, in particular. Um, but then I focus a lot on this guy, uh, Father Eusebio Quino, who was tasked, uh, was a Jesuit and was tasked with creating missions in Baja, California. And I read some of the documents of his in the Huntington Library, which is here in Southern California. And um, it was astonishing 
the lack of awareness and appreciation of the people he was trying to help coupled with his absolute conviction that he was doing the right thing and that these people needed to be saved and that they needed to come and live in missions. So, you know, he didn't understand their way of life. He would comment on their lack of political organization and spiritual commitment. He would comment on their poor diet. Um, and then on the other hand, he would say, you know, we need to teach them how to grow things, most of which they didn't succeed in growing, but because their diet was based on fruit and uh, nuts and seeds and fish. And I'm thinking, you know, if we had just stuck with that, we would be a lot better off today. Um, but in other spaces, he acknowledges that there are spiritual organizations and, and political organizations among the indigenous California, Californians, but he doesn't know what to do with those. He's so coming out of his own mindset. So it kind of sets up the question of how do we get out of that or is it possible? Um, and then I jump actually to the interwar period and the early post-World War II period. So the 1930s and 40s. Um, and the topic of my first book was on peace movements during that period and the move from the League of Nations to the UN. And I've always been fascinated. What would I do during that period? Would I, I have pacifist tendencies, would I remain that way or would I move to, you know, in what way? So I look at Christians um, and, and here also Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I use his terms of um, this was a world come of age. So as opposed to the early modern period where you had these debates among Catholics and Protestants and Catholics and Catholics, here you have um, this world come of age, which for Bonhoeffer means a secular world. We've got full-fledged modernity here. Um, and folks like Dorothy Day, founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, Simone Weil, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and the thinkers of the Harlem Renaissance are kind of the folks that I see to be better guides than, for example, Reinhold Niebuhr or H. Richard Niebuhr or the liberal Christian internationalists. Um, why? Because the former pointed to structural problems in colonial legacies, and they also showed the importance of risk-taking in trying to move towards something called radical equality. And then I talk about liberation theology in another chapter, the next chapter, its origins, based communities, suppression, violent suppression by the US, Latin American governments and the Vatican. And this is very, very interesting to me and has been for a long time because of the structural analysis of violence and inequality or poverty. So often it's criticized for being overly Marxist. Um, and actually Gustavo Gutierrez um, at Notre Dame a few years ago was kind of stepping back from that. But many liberationists did not step back from that. And so a lot of the struggle during that time was whether the common good allowed violence in overthrowing the kinds of oppression that folks were experiencing. And Archbishop Romero, for example, was very clear that violence was not allowed. But others, there were priests who joined um, the liberationist movements, for example, and who said they had to follow um, those who were who were leading this charge. And then I spent a little bit of time on uh, Rigoberta Menchu. I think she's particularly fascinating. She won the Nobel Peace Prize some time ago from Guatemala um, because she blends her Christian formation with her um, indigenous commitments and practices. And um, she foregrounded the indigenous commitments and practices. Indigeny had not gone away. So Christianity was important to her, but not as important as where she came from, who she, she saw, who she was as being beyond more than Christian. And that sets up chapter six. For a long time, I've thought about and uh, puzzled over the move, what I see as a move from liberationism to um, contemporary humanitarianism of all kinds. And there's a lot of differences with liberationism. It's much less of a structural analysis. Even when we talk about root causes, we're really kind of talking about root causes over there very often and not looking at the legacies of colonialism, the ongoing uh, militarisms that happen. I mean, those enter in, but usually from the side door <clears throat> and they're not a central part of the analysis very often of what, 
the problems of, that breed suffering are. So there's more of a rights-based focus today. And I think this entails a certain loss. And I would love to get your views on this. Um, and I think it leaves faith-based groups and other NGOs struggling with um, whether or not and how to accommodate or not to what has become known as neoliberalism and also statist militarism. So you've got the withdrawal of the state in social welfare provision, especially after the end of the Cold War and a greater establishment in, of the neo-colonial state in the non-Western world. And so this is primed for intervention of all kinds by wet Westerners well-intentioned and more militarist. Um, and of course, one of the ongoing problems in the literature on humanitarianism is whether partnerships are in fact egalitarian. And uh, one of the things I've traced in some other works is the push for metrics and measurement and the constant tension there. Um, and in this chapter then I, I also deal with the, the development of the codes of conduct for humanitarian practice uh, by the Sphere Project and others, um, and, uh, and, and versus the International Religious Freedom Act and the ongoing debates about religious freedom. So um, the code of conduct, I think, is a very good idea, but it's also difficult to put into practice its uh, goals of being apolitical. Um, but the, the good thing is that very often the proselytizers of the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries have become those who no longer want to proselytize. And I've traced this with um, Tanya Schwartz in another piece. Um, and so the idea is to respect culture and custom. So that's a big thing in the code of conduct. Um, but at the same time, it places FBOs and NGOs in this sort of position of being the objective ones who kind of look in on, on conflict, which in practice, it's in fact, it seems to me very difficult to do. Um, the IRFA, on the other hand, there was a big debate around its founding and I traced some of that debate in the US Senate um, and some of the, um, some of the opposition, particularly by Christians in other parts of the world who say, you know, this is like in Indonesia, this is going to mess up our relationship with, with the Muslims here if you focus on religious rights, um, because they saw that some of them, that it was going to prioritize some religions over others, perhaps. Um, one of the big academic criticisms uh, by people like Sabah Mahmoud, um, who unfortunately passed away um, a few years ago, um, also uh, Beth Hurd, is that it, it puts people's identities into one box, um, this one kind of religious identity, and that that does a disservice to folks. Um, but I would also point out in this chapter that it can encourage, I mean, you've got a lot of folks pushing um, the IRFA who also push a potential military response when religious rights are harmed. Um, so I think that that's an issue. Um, I also look at interfaith efforts at reconciliation. Um, some say that those do not account for religious syncretisms and hybridities which also entail colonial legacies. And for me, those are extremely important. I'm fascinated by um, hybridities and syncretisms. Um, and I used two theologians from the Global South, Chung Hyung Kun and um, Christopher Durasang, to widen our understanding of Christianity. Um, both of them focus on spirit and uh, Kung in particular focuses on syncretisms in her East Asian notion. And she says she's part Buddhist and shaman and Christian and, you know, she brings all these things together. And uh, Durasang uh, really centers on um, ontologies that coalesce indigenous religious traditions in Asia um, and other parts of the world with Christianity. And he quotes a Korean theologian and says, you know, who says that, an invalid God was not carried piggyback to Korea by some missionary, that God was already active in history long before. And I think that for me, that's really, really important. Um, I grew up Catholic. I now hang out with Episcopalians, as I say, 
um, I like to think of myself as increasingly interfaith, but I often wonder, especially in my own work, which um, a lot of the most recent work has had to do with um, work in different parts of Africa and the Middle East, um, that are not necessarily part of this book, that'll be part of the next book. But um, it's astonishing to me how Christians over time have assumed that their ways were best and how secularists have also done that, right? It's astonishing to me now, um, how do we welcome and acknowledge a range of cosmology, cosmologies and ways of being? So it's the same with the secular, you know, the promotion of democracy, for example, while oversimplifying or not understanding other forms of governments, governance, and um, the promotion of accountability in ways that, in my view, are neocolonial. Um, and regarding the issue also of how we represent the suffering of others um, for our own marketing purposes. Um, and um, I find, you know, that in a way we're all part of this big system um, that I think we need to keep critiquing from within and bringing ever more potent critiques. And I have a couple of closing comments. I've been thinking a lot about this in the current context of COVID-19 and also anti-Black racism work, which for anybody in the US um, is huge right now. I think both have exposed major fissures in who takes the most risks um, because some people have to because of who they are, what their skin color is or what their jobs are, whether they are essential workers, medical workers. Um, so they have to, it hasn't been a choice um, like those of the Harlem Renaissance, if you will. But what about the rest of us, folks like me, my positionality is a white Western woman. So especially in reference to the work of anti-Black racism, you know, there's a need for white folks like me to stand back and not be the one to articulate solutions, but to act on those developed by the people who've been most affected for all these generations. And it's incumbent on me to understand the systems and the structures and the legacies that put us all here. So I think this current and ongoing reckoning with anti-Black racism has crystallized for me some of what um, I was trying to say in the book about Christianity and secularism um, and humanitarianism. And um, it's usually my um, <laughs> practice after I write something to engage in auto-critique. Um, so now I question whether I, I said it clearly enough um, I question, you know, to what degree I or any of us have the capacity to say it clearly enough. But when we talk about um, humanitarian partnerships, when we talk about respect, when we talk about uh, working with folks, I think, I hope that the book uh, probes some of those questions and puts them out there for all of us to deal with. So thank you. Thank you very much, um, Cecilia. Um, that was wonderful. And I think, um, well, I have spiraling questions coming out from that, but what we'll do now is we'll hand over to Alistair um, for a little bit of dialogue, some um, back and forth on thoughts around that. Um, and we'll open up to the other participants, um, to the rest of the group later on for some question and answers as well. Alistair, over to you. Thanks, Olivia, and thanks so much, Cecilia. And yeah, it's a great privilege to open up discussion, I think, on this important book. And as you mentioned, Cecilia, then uh, to let people know, Cecilia did me the, the honor um, at Fuller, probably about seven years ago, I think it is now, uh, to make some uh, commentary on some initial reflections on the work that became the book, Faith, Separism, Humanitarian Engagement, uh, along with Joey Ager. Um, and uh, the, some of the themes of that book and continued work I'm engaged in that echo with Cecilia's, but Cecilia's also brought me into territory that uh, other parts of my identity, other parts of my, my work connect to. So I just have three or four areas, themes, I suppose, that came up in the reading of this book, and I wanted to share them with you all, but share them with Cecilia, and probably as we go through, for Cecilia to begin to respond to some of those things as a way of starting the dialogue, which will then eventually lead to full Q&A. 
to, to the first theme I wanted to reflect on was this notion of wrestling. And I, and I first of all wanted to thank you for the foregrounding of this term, which um, in my own faith experiences is a very real one. And, and for many people that I know, this notion of wrestling, of working through, of revisiting what um, Joey, who I work with, thinks about as theological reflection on new circumstances. And it's been a quite an important concept, I think, in various forms of development and humanitarian work, where there's this presentation that faith communities are not uh, limited by strict dogma, but are organic. They, they are engaged in theological reflection, whether it's on child protection or the rights on gender-based violence. The assumption, challenging the assumption that religion is a set, uh, set of beliefs or, or behaviors, but rather an understanding that uh, religious communities are often engaged in a form of reflection, which the word wrestling, I think, captures quite well. So I, I wanted to acknowledge and thank you for that. And yet I also realized that I have, I am um, a little naive, maybe sometimes, of, of considering the universality of that notion of reflection, or indeed of that respect of that notion of, of wrestling. And, and there were two particular instances that I wanted to share. One was that when I have spoken on the issue of faith engagement in humanitarianism, it's fairly clear to me a pattern of the, the strongest pushback I get is from uh, young professionals whose religious experience, religious formation was very much not one of wrestling and reflection, but one of the experience of dogma and a sense of you believe this or, or you're out. And that their humanitarianism often a reaction to that sense of, of entrapment with a certain framing, a certain dogma, which you, you note is there at the edges. Um, and, and I think you, you, you promote a fairly strong middle ground between the edges of this. But I wanted to check with you really, are we, are we being too optimistic that these are the dogmas just at the edge, or if it actually is fairly frequently that the experience of many religious traditions, that actually there is not much wrestling or wrestling is not allowed or encouraged, rather it is of set positions. And um, very pertinent to the forthcoming uh, American election, I only recently saw some discussion of Obama's wrestling on the issue of gay marriage or Biden's wrestling on the issue of abortion. Now, I understand both of them change their positions on those issues. And I, I think in terms of the tenets of your book, their religious formation, their, their Christian rooting in different traditions would have been influential in that wrestling. Uh, and I do indeed see both of those issues are one that warrant wrestling. But I also understand that within the US, that wrestling is not necessarily welcomed. That wrestling is seen as a sign of weakness and flip-flopping. So I, I just wanted to hand back to you, Cecilia, to, it's such a key and really valuable idea, this notion of wrestling and debate and discussion. And I suppose I'm particularly struck, you, you hinted at a number of points in the book, it took a number of years to pull the book together. I wonder if you feel that the, 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 the tolerance of wrestling has changed over the, the years of putting this together. And at the moment, whether you feel there is less encouragement or reflection of openness to wrestling or, or what your view is of the trajectory of that notion of openness to debate and seriousness of engagement. So there's, there's a couple of other things I'd like to pursue. Can I, can I just start with that one? What, what, what do you make of my comments on your construct of wrestling? I, you want me to respond now? I, I think so. Then that would, I think oh, that will be. Okay. okay. Well, one, I think, it's, I think it's very astute. I think that um, part of, uh, of the, the issue in the book and the way I'm framing it is that there's so much, especially academic attention to religious extremes. And, and let's not lose sight of the fact that this wrestling does take place. And, and maybe one way to think about it is that the wrestling takes place in different ways, right? Sometimes, um, I, I think you're right about the dogma of not being really at the edge in a lot of religious experience, not just in the US, but in other parts of the world. But I think that an overemphasis on that 
then then negates the idea of the, the wrestling that does take place. And I would just say one of the fascinating things about being in the US today, just on my email, um, you know, not by my seeking them out, but now there are all kinds of Christian uh, organizations that are trying to take back. I've been wondering where they've been over the last 15 years, but they're trying to take back the middle ground in terms of what is Christianity. So there's Faithful America that is calling on people to send letters and emails and everything to you know, against Amy Coney Barrett, against, you know, and in four of uh, this kind of thing, there's uh, William Barber's Poor People's March and Poor People's Campaign, you know, in, in um, coming out of the East Coast. So uh, there's a lot of activism and, and that's, but that's not to discount what you're saying. My worry about some of those young professionals in the um, NGO conferences I go to is that, and, and Tanya Schwartz and I wrote a piece on donor proselytism, is that there sometimes people in rejecting, you know, the sort of religious thing, um, which, you know, the dogma I think should be mostly rejected or at least questioned, always questioned. Um, but in so doing, they then, I'm not saying all of them do, but some of them are very willing to be trained and developed and socialized into a kind of uh, neoliberal dogma, that this is how you help people over there. And, and so I find that equally uh, dangerous. So I think you raise a very good point. Um, I think there is wrestling today. Um, I think we need to keep our, I think more of us need to do it. <laughs> And maybe, and I think we need to question each other as we do it. I want to come on to neoliberalism perhaps, perhaps next. It was one of the foundational, and, and I think you clarified this in, in, in your opening remarks, that, that the wrestling and the debate is very much a, a constant theme in the book. So is, is the questioning, which I fully support you in, about opposing um, Christianity and secularism or, or religion and secularism, but rather see secularism in many, many ways as an offshoot or a variant of Christian thought um, and, and uh, the recognition that some of our work is to recognize those biases or those forms and in terms of in, interacting with the other, as you spoke, to try to decolonize or, or to realize the, 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 the fragile basis of uh, modern secular liberal thought if you like so I, I really enjoyed that engagement but again I, I have although I take that view I, I have a dilemma which I want to publicly confess to which is that my sense of challenging um, sort of secular liberalism as a framing um, feels a little different in 2020 than it does to 2010 where it was the big show in town, it was the dominant global view, it has clearly triumphed, and we were doing a good service to challenge the, the neoliberal tendencies within it. If, if, if you have the critique of this juggernaut, this one way of thinking, this presumptive way of thinking, we were doing a, a potential service to, to re realize that the, the dangers of, of that blindness. I suppose in 2020 and feeling less confident of the modern enterprise and the liberal enterprise, the emergence of China and Russia and of totalitarianism, I feel a little bit more muted in my critique of that way of thinking as, as a, a compromise, a, a, a not particularly effective way of finding common cause, but maybe less harmful than other forms of political thought. Now, I'm not completely rejecting that, but I, I recognize a dilemma that by throwing stones at the modern liberal secular framework, we're potentially damaging something which has protected us from other forms of totalitarian thought, which are very evident and mentioning COVID are arguing that they are a more strong, more efficient form of, of governance. So I just wondered again, during the course of writing the book, that idea, which I fully support of, recognizing that these Christian ethical dilemmas are part of secular dilemmas, whether they're recognized or, 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 or not. But whether that whole enterprise of thinking, I'm not saying it's falling apart, but, but, but as, it, as it becomes uh, 
tensions at the seams of that thinking. Are you like me a little troubled by that as well as pleased by it that we're showing the, the deficiencies of it, the awareness that actually it's also served peace and, and, and many quite well and prosperity quite well and that we need to be cautious of just throwing stones at that modern liberal secular enterprise. Um, again, that's a fantastic question. And I think especially um, given the populism in the US, um, you know, the, the Trumpian populism in the US, in, in the UK, um, in, in Russia, in India, in, you know, Brazil, et cetera, um, and, and in much of Europe, you know, it's, it's a question of whether the liberal institutions that a lot of us, including myself, have been criticizing for a while, um, if in fact they're good enough, and in fact, now that they're in danger of being completely destroyed, you know, uh, shouldn't we have been perhaps supporting them more all along? And um, I guess um, my response to that is, is twofold. I think that it is, you know, and certainly, um, you know, I'm doing my part right now in, in, in uh, or trying to do my part in making phone calls for the, you know, for the, the presidential ticket that I want and things like that. Um, and, and, you know, doing that kind of campaigning and all of that, even if, you know, it's not necessarily representative of everything that I think. But I do think that this is an opportunity, perhaps, to say that, yes, um, yes, there, these institutions have done particular kinds of things, you know, they have promoted a rule of law, they have promoted a, um, you know, a, 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 or, or a certain kinds of justice, they've promoted certain kinds of distribution, certain kinds of peace. But if we don't also look at, for example, right now, the, the destruction of these institutions is happening at the same, in our country, in, in the US, at the same time, that Black Lives Matter and others are showing the very foundations of some of those institutions in systemic racism. And so if we're not willing to look at that, then it, it, I don't think that going back to what we had in 2010 or 2000 is good enough, in part because it might've been good enough for me as a white woman, um, you know, who is, you know, now has an academic salary, um, even though I wasn't raised in that class, but, but, but it was never good enough for a lot of folks who were summarily pulled over, summarily killed, summarily, um, or who, who uh, their only opportunity was to work in sweatshops, um, you know, their whatever, it was never good enough for them. And I think that what this is doing is laying bare some of that. So I think it's a real struggle. I really do. And I have this debate with one of my colleagues all the time who um, is opposed to what she calls ideology, you know, of, of the left, which certainly, you know, can be overbearing. Um, but again, that's a, I was going to say that that's a good connection to the other point I just wanted to raise. I, I want to leave time for general Q&A. Sure. In the particular area around humanitarianism that you address, uh, I think it's chapter six. Yeah, you know, I think that's really well, for, and I think your answer responds very well to that. Is that is the humanitarian system good enough? Well, in some senses, yes. In other senses, not at all. It has been, you know, a, a, a machine of huge, huge injustice, and the calls for reform it in, in the radical way that you're talking about are, are very um, appropriate. I think um, you, I think, will have heard uh, the my book on, on faith and humanitarianism starts with the reflection of my time in Darfur, where there was no wrestling in who were the good people, who were the bad people, what was the agenda and so on, and a complete lack of awareness within the humanitarian um, uh, response of even that there was any wrestling or reflection. It was very, very clear. It was, it was presumed what the agenda was. And, and I, maybe we wouldn't repeat that 15 years later now in, in terms of that presumption. Um, but it, it, it does strike me that your book is very much unearthing 
dilemmas, tensions, debates at key historical times. I think you're very interested in that humanitarian space. I'm struck of how little debate there really is in that humanitarian space. And I think you do a strong critique of this um, sort of neoliberal uh, faith-based uh, faith neoliberal humanitarianism, where for many faith-based providers, there is they have chosen to align themselves with that particular ideology rather than um, what I've found a useful framing in terms of, say, Cornell West's work, not a particularly prominent social thinker, but, but in terms of a more prophetic voice in this, mm -hmm. of actually caught, seeing that the religious voice is one that is forcing debate, forcing disagreement, rather than one that comes together with a sort of a cosy coalition of, of response, which potentially hides the huge structural inequalities, which as you say, are not over there, but they're here driving over there. So that's not so much a question, it's a reflection that the discussion we just were having, it seems to me that's particularly manifest in the humanitarian space. And I wondered if you had any thoughts of how to surface or encourage an awareness of those debates rather than it seems to there's there's great fear of, a, of of bringing them up. I don't for all them that talk about ethics or humanitarian ethics, the ethical principles are very very tightly constrained on the sorts of issues you were hinting at early on. There's not much of a space for a much broader framing of ethical dilemmas in the, in that sphere. Um, I think that um, in, in terms of of bringing up those questions, you alluded to this in the very beginning of your of your comments that there are a lot of folks engaged in reflection and wrestling in the humanitarian and development spheres. And um, for my current project, book project, I've interviewed a number of folks in Christian and Muslim uh, faith-based groups in different parts of Africa and the Middle East, a um, couple of hundred people, I think. And most, not all, but most really appreciated the time you know, I infringed on their time you know, by 45 minutes to a couple of hours or, or, or more, but to reflect. And a lot of them did reflect. And some of them have been involved in this kind of work for ages. Um, and so I think that the ability for that kind of reflection is there. I see it sometimes in uh, some of the humanitarian newsletters, but I confess that I'm not um, a constant consumer of all of them. And so I'll have to learn from you and maybe others here, which ones I should keep track of. Um, and, um, you know, also with the blog that I co-edit on critical investigations into humanitarianism in Africa, one of the things we want to do is to be in more dialogue with, um, I mean, I'm the only non-African editor, co-editor of that blog. And we want to be in more dialogue with um, humanitarians and development folks about how to do this. So, you know, we're looking for openings. Um, I'm looking for openings and... Um, yeah, that's great. So Celia, just to note on that, I know there are a number of people on the call who may then come in come in on that. And, and with your response, actually on what I was saying, don't see much debate. I see debate around the, the periphery, if you like, but in terms of the powerful international actors there's, there's less incentive i guess for that for, for that radical change and that and, and changing the terms of that debate fits in with what you were saying earlier um olivia I, one last comment if I, if I may to cecilia and then very much for this to lead in into broader discussion um that although the humanitarianism chapter i found very interesting it also challenged me the subsequent work around freedom of religion or belief and this is because and i'll give a very practical uh, example the UK government uh, currently has uh, a commitment to exploring this area and the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab, is clearly committed to the UK, and this is very much a post-Brexit UK in the world vision, of being a force for democracy and freedom. And so that the notion of freedom of religion or belief is, is consonant with that. And yet the way it's been taken forward with by certain actors has been um, particularly interpreting that as protection of Christian minorities in a majority Muslim world. And the Bishop of Truro's report in that area was very much consulting with Christians and their persecution. 
So that seems to me in UK politics at the moment, the closest to a genuine area of wrestling of trying to work out what the UK's liberal values mean in that world. And that partly does reflect religious freedoms. It partly reflects a Christian tradition, but it also partly reflects a Christian tradition that points to tolerance to other religions and so forth. So again, a, a part, just a, a final thought for you in terms of international relations. If you were brought in as a consultant, and you may well be suggested by me as a consultant to Dominic Raab in terms of in this agenda in international relations of acknowledging the, the, the heritage of the UK as a Christian nation historically, but as a modern nation, as a secular state, but you're arguing that those two are not in contradiction of each other, they can be in continuity with, with one another. How would you advise managing these tensions re regarding the, the, the wrestling between whether freedom of religion means an openness to all or a protection for some or a preference for some? How, how would you suggest managing or structuring that wrestling at an international relations sort of policy level? Would you have any guides for that? Um, well, one very practical and one that uh, Dominique Robb probably wouldn't care for. So the, the practical one um, is simply to see the religious freedom discourse as a means of, uh, of, of wrestling with what the UK is today. And the fact that the UK has to be open. It, it's got citizens from of all kinds of religions. It's got, you know, and then the one that Dominique Robb probably wouldn't like so much is let's look at the origins of that. It has to do with British imperialism. It has to do with British oppression and British trying to, you know, I mean, the reason why there are so many uh, folks whose lineage is was from South Asia, for example, is because of British colonialism. So how can Britain expect to control all these areas of the world without uh, and, and only exploit them, which is which is kind of, you know, and, and now not to have anything sort of mess up what it thought of as its nice order. So I don't think Dominic Robb would like that one so much, but this is where we need to really reckon with these legacies. Thanks so much, Cecilia. I'll, Olivia, I'll hand back to you. We, I could chat with Cecilia all, all day about this, but that's not our plan. So uh, back over to you. Sure, um, I want to be able to throw it open to the rest of the group. Um, so please either raise your hand um, or just unmute now and we'll have time for some questions and answers um, and thoughts from others. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, thank you so much, Cecilia. I haven't uh, read the book, I've just listened to it, and it is fascinating uh, to begin with, even the imagery of, of wrestling. And I was just wondering and thinking aloud, really, and thanks very much, uh, uh, Alistair, for the things that you have also raised in conversation. And I'm thinking loud, wondering, for people who have experienced colonialism, neo-colonialism, that it is still going on somehow. And at the moment, they are uh, being faced with this secular liberal thought that is uh, really tramping on their indigeneity, that they were trying to rise up and claim their identity. But there is so much that is uh, putting them, them, them down and wrestling silently. When will we accommodate the silent wrestling? And wrestling being an imagery from my context is an imagery, imagery of masculinity. And wondering in what ways does the other gender wrestle and when are they even listened to that they are, being, they, they, they are wrestling? They are trained uh, not to wrestle physically, for example, or even in mind uh, to just accept what, what, what is being given. And wrestling, when you look at it in terms of gender, age, and, and race, you did mention race. 
And secondly, how, and, and you, you conversed with Ulster a, a bit, in terms of the, even the colonial, neo-colonial and secular liberal thought in terms of humanitarian, how do we deal with the fact that even those that carry, uh, challenge those systems uh, benefit from them as well? How do you, uh, 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 yeah, how do you critique that? Because there's benefit, as you say, that you're a white woman academic. There's a sense in which even from this whole humanitarian thought, there's a benefit that comes even to those that are uh, claiming to do uh, well. Thank you. Esther, please could you quickly introduce yourself, just your name and um, university? <laughs> My, my names are Esther Mombo. I am a Kenyan and I work at uh, St. Paul's University. I am a graduate of several uh, places, but uh, much more from Edinburgh University. And I can see a few people from that university. Emma, how are you? Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Esther, both for coming and, and for that question. Um, I think your observation that wrestling is an image of masculinity is, yeah, it is very true. Um, and the biblical story that it's drawn from is a guy, right, who was wrestling um, with, with God, with an angel, with, you know, we're not quite sure perhaps, but um, those who wrestle silently, um, you know, women and, um, and, uh, indigenous uh, folks. And, and I think that those, that's really, really critical. I do think what's ironic here is that the system that we're all involved with or these systems, um, including the humanitarian system, you know, right now, anything having, or for some time, anything having to do with women and children has been very trendy, very sexy, very funded, right? but only in particular kinds of ways. Um, and so if you're accepting that funding then, and you have other agendas, you know, you have to figure out how to do them. Um, and, and, you know, that in and of itself is kind of a, is, you know, a silent wrestling, let alone all those who still remain kind of untouched or, or insufficiently uh, touched or funded by these systems. Um, so to me, that's, it, it's a, it's an ironic thing. It's a paradox that, you know, women's stuff is, there's so much funding out there for it. And yet I think you're right to point out that women um, in many parts of the world are silently wrestling. Um, you know, I don't have the solution for that, except for folks like you to keep saying it and for all the rest of us to be listening. Um, and, and in terms of uh, indigenous folks, I mean, one of the things I'm seeing in, in trends in academia and in sort of public discourse, you know, here in Southern California, you know, there are more and more fires, right? Um, in Kenya, there's this, in different parts of Kenya, um, you know, you've got uh, drought followed by floods, you've got, you know, I mean, various other, every part of the world has its issues. And, and so one of the big things, um, obviously that we need to deal with is climate change. And back to one of Alistair's previous questions, simply returning to the liberal, secular liberal institutions of the past is not addressing climate change uh, sufficiently, but there is more attention to indigenous practices out there. Um, in some ways, there's attention to indigenous practices that simply wants to um, appropriate them. And I think that's really problematic, appropriate and reframe them and sometimes profit off of them. So, um, you know, the indigenous folks I've met in uh, Senegal, for example, and in Kenya as well, um, 
and in in a few other places, you know, are are very with it in terms of opposing that. But there are also, I know that indigeneity is threatened, you know, in so many ways, when in fact we should be thinking of learning from these kinds of indigeneity. So even those, I mean, yes, um, I do benefit from these systems and everybody involved in either the humanitarian world, the academic world, um, you know, religious structures benefits in a sense. So um, for me, one thing that I feel that I'm continuing to learn from uh, the anti-Black racism movement, as well as my work um, with the blog that we work on um, and, um, and in some of my interviews is this notion of um, whose voices need to be foregrounded in terms of solutions, right? I think that part of my um, uh, purpose maybe or function is to help point out where, you know, folks like me go wrong, but also um, to point out the ethical precarity of any solutions that we come up with. But then to stand back and follow those um, who are pointing the way to something new, to ruptures, to more creativity, to new ways of being, or to recovering other ways of being um, in new ways it, that include indigeneity. A long time ago in Nairobi, I met a, um, a white guy from, I believe, Canada, who had been there for years, uh, several decades. He'd arrived, he was Mennonite, and he uh, talked about arriving and being seconded uh, to um, some of the uh, Black Pan-Africanist leaders uh, in Kenya at the time. And I said, wow, what was that like? And he said it was great that he was basically a warm white body. Um, doing, you know, everybody else, they kind of thought, okay, this guy is harmless. He's not going to, you know, over, you know, we can use him. He can help us out. He can do some of the grunt work. And so I think that that is something that we need to be thinking of and um, is how do we get the grunt work done um, to, to really put these challenges into place? I'm not sure if that really addresses your question. But um, I think the recognitions of a lot of this are a big step. Thank you. We are at time. I noticed that a few people have had to leave. Um, I think that if there's maybe one or two other questions, um, maybe we could have an extra five minutes for those that don't have to leave. But um, I, you know, very much understanding that we're people are rushing off to other meetings now too um, in our in our Zoom life. Um, Thank you very much to Cecilia and um, Alistair for a very thought provoking session today. I must admit I've been on rather a roller coaster from um, very much agreeing that um, this astonishing way in which Christians and now secularists have assumed their ways are best that Cecilia noted to then um, Alistair noting that perhaps we, the difference between 2010 and 2020 um, was particularly stark and in fact what have we done if we're still critiquing something when actually maybe it's not that bad in comparison to other things um but then coming back round to just this idea that yes you know there has still been somewhat of this um in you know insidious uh, entitlement that's all around us um, in some of the, the humanitarian world um, and the a need for real humility around um, many of our own positions um, and I really hope to be able to um, continue in our reading groups as we go into next year to talk and think about some of this a bit more. So thank you everyone for your time. Um, I think that um, I'll just share that slide again so that you have um, Cecilia's, um, if I managed to do that, Cecilia's email address um, and you can follow up with her um, with any further questions. Um, I'm sure um, that will be that will be possible. I'm just offering that Cecilia, but <laughs> hopefully that's okay as well. <laughs>
Thanks so much, Olivia and uh, Rima and all the JLI and Alistair as well. Yeah, thanks everyone, thanks Cecilia. Thank you. Um, so we'll, our next session is actually quite soon because we're going back to um, the, uh, the next session is on the 12th of November back in the monthly schedule that we have. Um, and we will be sending out more information about that soon. And the recording of this session will also be going on the website soon. So um, I think I am actually going to just wrap it up now because I know that the other people are going off to other meetings. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. And um, thank you for your time and participation. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.